So you want to do a research project, but you don't know where to start. Don't worry, I often uh, feel the same. I'm often stuck in that situation when planning a, a new study or planning to undertake a new study where I feel uh, just too overwhelmed with everything that lies ahead, with all these decisions that you have to make when planning and later conducting research studies. So in this video, I just compiled a list of uh, steps, a list of stages of planning such study so that you don't have to worry about it. So it's basically a checklist at each stage, I also try to link to additional resources uh, that will hopefully be useful. So the first stage in planning your research project, just like with any project, any endeavor, any business, is to get the idea, of course, to get the idea. Except that in this case, if you're planning research, what this involves is uh, going and doing as much reading as possible. So that's always, there is a reason why as PhD student or master student, the first thing you do, usually you're required to do your literature review because that's where you need to get that idea. You can't just uh, take it out of thin air. You have to read a lot. You have to understand gaps uh, in the literature. You have to understand what has been done, uh, the ways in which it has been done and uh, as a result, in the long term, you have to understand uh, where there is certain uh, gap or need for a study that needs to be addressed. And that's where your study comes in. And another important point here is that just uh, because there is a gap uh, doesn't always uh, mean that there is a need for a study. So just remember that as well. You don't always just want to fill in a gap in research because maybe sometimes there is a reason there is a gap. Nobody needs that kind of a study. In the same way, uh, you may also replicate another study. You may replicate another study to add to that body of evidence that we have, or you may replicate it in a different context, slightly different context, slightly different participants. So don't worry too much about there being no studies done on a certain topic because it's almost impossible these days. Every, uh, almost every cert every possible topic has been addressed by some sort of a, uh, sort of a study. And around the same time when uh, you're thinking about uh, this need for a study, uh, you'll be thinking about, uh, and it really helps to think early about the implications for the study. So basically, who's going to benefit from this study? It's part of the rationale or the whole uh, uh, justification and the idea for why we need a study. Who's going to benefit from your study? Usually, uh, there is, uh, well, ideally, you have somebody or some organization, some group of people or something in mind, who's going to benefit? How are we going to use the findings? Or in other words, uh, what problem or issue uh, does our study address? Or do you hope your study to address and solve? So at this point, basically, you're beginning to form the aim of your study or what it will aim to achieve. So to achieve this aim, uh, you need uh, some sort of research questions or questions that need to be answered to achieve that aim. And remember that your research questions need to be doable, realistic, and clear. And how you word them will tell people about the type of study that you're conducting. So think them through properly. If you want to know more about this and how uh, the wording of your research questions uh, implies a lot about your study, uh, check out uh, some of the links that I share under the video. So next thing you'll need to decide is where to seek this information, the information that you need to, or, uh, to answer your research questions, to achieve the aims of your study. And around the same time, how to get access to it, how to get access to this information. For example, who are the people who can help you gain insight into the problem you're exploring? A group of people who participate in your study are called a sample, because uh, they are a sample taken from a wider a population of people who could help you answer these questions. But remember, sample does not always have to refer to people. It can refer to a subset of data taken from a larger data set. And this can include numerical data, textual data, or images, among others type of data. So, uh, so it doesn't always have to be people, although in qualitative research, very often, at some point at least, you are involving people in your study. So as I said, once you decided on a sample, you also decide, you make decisions as to how to gain access to that sample. So remember that you want to be realistic and early on you want to be sure that you have access, you have such access or you have a possibility to gain such access to your sample. Otherwise, you may fall into a trap and uh, plan a study that's just difficult to, uh, to conduct later on if you, for example, don't have access to that sample. So as I said, in most studies and qualitative research, uh, most studies involve uh, people. 
So, uh, so researchers, so as a researcher, you're thinking, how do I get access uh, to these people? And how do I recruit these people? How do I select these people? So all of that is basically about selection criteria, which is something you have to think about early on. So what, what kind of people you want to include, but also recruitment uh, strategy, recruitment method. So how do I recruit uh, these people? And I would say that the most uh, common, the most uh, popular uh, recruitment strategy and qualitative research is purposeful sampling, which basically means that, or a combination of purposeful and convenience sampling. So purposeful sampling means that uh, you're sampling, you're recruiting uh, the participants uh, you choose basically based on your judgment, your belief. So you believe these people will be the right people to answer these questions. And that's why you're going after this group of people. And convenience sampling is kind of similar. It's basically based on convenience. Do I have access to these people? So basically I'm recruiting among people uh, who I do have access to. That's, uh, you know, who are convenient for me to recruit, not people maybe from a completely different context and country. So as I said, it's, it's very often that we employ a combination of the two because I, I'm doing it purposefully. I have this idea of who I want to recruit or talk to, but also I'm basing... Uh, I'm, I'm I'm basing it is based on uh, convenience on something I feel like I can actually access. There are many other ways, for example, snowball sampling, where your participants later uh, help you recruit the next participants, the subsequent participants. So I'm talking to a, a person, for example, and at the end of the interview. I'm asking, do you know anyone you think could be also a useful sor source of information for me? So that's snowball sampling. There's a few other types uh, of sampling. And now also around that time, of course, you have to decide how you're going to collect that information. So you have this rough idea of who you're going to talk to or or who you're going to gather the data from or where you're going to gather data from, because maybe, like I said, you don't even want to involve people. But uh, the next uh, decision, uh, is how do I gather that information? So if you are working with people, what is the best way to get that information from them? You can use a variety of methods, such as interviews, group interviews, observations, focus groups. Uh, you can ask them to draw things or act things out or fill in uh, diaries. So uh, there's hardly any limit in, in uh, the methods that you can employ. There are some standard methods, uh, but then I constantly see when I talk to people and I talk to students who are not even experienced doing research and very often I'm impressed by their creativity and what they chose in their study. There are so many different ways in which you can involve your participants. And, uh, and like I said, it's pretty impressive sometimes what people come up with. You can also um, combine several methods in which case we talk about triangulation, triangulation of methods, triangulation of data. So basically, gathering information from different sources, which increases validity of your findings later. So credibility, credibility, because you gather data from and compare data from a couple of different uh, sources and a couple of different perspectives. And then you can also combine qualitative methods with quantitative methods in a study called mixed methods research, where the methods complement each other. And one stage of the study usually influ influences the development of the other stage. But to learn more, you can just watch my videos. I have several videos about mixed methods research. Now, another thing you may have heard about, and this is something I always describe as one of the most confusing topics related to research, are philosophical worldviews. I also have a whole video explaining such wor worldviews in more detail. But on the whole, in summary, the point is that whatever you choose to explore and how you choose to explore it tells people a lot about your philosophical assumptions, even if you did not know about them. So that's important. Of course, uh, chances are you probably never reflected on your philosophical assumptions about the nature of being, the nature of knowledge. But, but what you choose to do basically implies some assumptions. So for example, the fact that someone wants to conduct a quantitative study that uses scientific methods to observe, measure, or predict certain phenomena, may indicate that he or she believes in a relatively stable nature of reality and knowledge, where the, wor where the world uh, consists of, of stable structures uh, that exist independently of us and should therefore be objectively measured and observed. Scientific methods uh, should therefore be used and people uh, people's personal views should not be considered as they are insignificant and constitute a sign of uh, personal biases. So, so you don't need uh, those uh, to get in the way of your study, of your research. And all these views that I described, they are included in a broader paradigm called positivism, 
which then has its more detailed ontologies and epistemologies or beliefs about the nature of reality and beliefs about ways in which it can be as, uh, assess, accessed and explored uh, respectively but like i said i do have separate videos about that so uh, so that's another separate topic i also have a course a self-study course about this and all the other things i'm talking about in this video so each stage that i'm describing in that course i go into much more detail uh, of and I just explain and uh, and really explore all these things in much more detail. It's a video course and it's, it's extremely cheap. So so in addition to browsing through my YouTube videos, you can also have a look at that course, but no pressure and I'll still address everything that I need to in this video. So now another thing that you may uh, have heard about. So let's address it, our methodology. So basically as a whole, everything you have come up with so far uh, so everything, including the rationale for your study, its aims, the methods you're planning to use, the worldviews that I just discussed, uh, sometimes, sometimes, not always, suits a certain template, or that's how I like to describe it, a template for doing a study. So your beliefs about the knowledge, the ways to access that knowledge, your choice of method, the context of your study, the, the aims of the study, all of it. And if there is such template or such a general way of, of approaching and conducting a study, uh, then we refer to it as a methodology. There are several known methodologies you may have heard uh, about them. Uh, the most well-known ones are case study, narrative inquiry, phenomenology, grounded theory, ethnography. And each one of these methodologies has uh, these beliefs and procedures. So, uh, for example, if a topic you're planning to explore is relatively under-researched and you're planning to either develop a theory or at least a very detailed explanation of the studied phenomenon, whilst at the same time reducing the possible influence of the previous knowledge and findings to the minimum. This may mean that you are conducting a study that can be uh, described as a grounded theory study. There are also other methodologies. I have a video in which I review each one of these most common, most popular methodologies. Uh, but remember that, and this is very important, you don't always have to choose methodology. There is very often I, I come across this view and I hear it from students, and very often this pressure comes from their supervisors, unfortunately, but there is this pressure to choose methodology. Like I said, you may decide that what you are planning to do fits a certain methodology, in which case it's, it's helpful to describe your study as such, as a study within that methodology. However, you can just talk about your study being a qualitative inquiry, a detailed qualitative in investigation, and so on and so forth. So you don't have to describe it in terms of certain methodology. It's just these methodologies are meant to help you if it happens, it just happens that you can describe your study in those uh, terms. And the reason I'm discussing this here is, of course, because again, we're talking about planning a study. So try to get all these things, these all these building blocks in place, try to get as much clarity as you have about all these things. It really resembles writing a research proposal. So maybe some of you have done it or planning to do it where you also have to describe all these things. So what methods, what recruitment uh, criteria, uh, and so on and so forth. So what am I going to, to do uh, to conduct that study? So it really helps to have that checklist. Don't forget to check out my ebook entitled Scholar's Guide to AI-Assisted Thematic Analysis, which is a useful resource for thematic analysis, whether you do plan to use AI or not. It contains plenty of useful advice, step-by-step -step instructions for thematic analysis, and a list of prompts that you can copy and paste into ChatGPT. So now uh, the next position in that checklist is deciding once you've gathered that data, what are you going to do with it? So basically this means, of course, deciding on your data analysis, your data analysis methods and approaches to data analysis. Again, these will differ depending on the study, depending on, on the aims, depending on the type of data that you have in your study. So it definitely can feel overwhelming. And of course, and that's the reason why usually people who who reach out to me for some support, they usually struggle with that aspect of their study or, or they are completely stuck at that stage of their study. Don't worry, it's perfectly normal. And uh, I do have plenty of video where I talk about data analysis specifically, so feel free to watch these videos. Um, and also, as I often explain, most of these approaches, although uh, the proponents of these approaches, they would absolutely hate to admit it, most of these approaches, they really uh, boil down to very similar stages of the analysis. And these uh, usually involve some sort of, uh, well, reducing the volume of the collected data. That's the first thing you want to do uh, by coding it, which is basically a term used to describe a practice of essentially labeling parts of the text with short descriptive 
terms or phrases. So that's coding. And later you organize these codes, you create it into groups to make sense of what you have in the data. So again, it's just these codes are, I often say is like your uh, table of contents of your data. You first create a, a list of long list of random codes, then you organize these codes into something that actually makes sense. So some sort of, of grouping. And having such codes, as I said, is a starting point in almost every approach to data analysis. And what happens next may differ slightly, but usually it involves using these codes to form uh, some more inclusive and larger analytic units or elements of narrative, whether we call them narrative blocks or themes or something else. So that will slightly differ between the different approaches, but don't worry because it's always uh, down to these steps that I that I described. It's always, and don't forget that, it's always just essentially about you trying to make sense of the data and try to answer your research questions. And whilst this may change and you may change your approach to coding, you may change it if you're uh, piloting your study or changing uh, change the methods throughout based on your, your judgment, your assumptions. Again, we're talking about these early stages and planning your study, it does help uh, to have some general idea of what you're planning to do with your data once you collect it. Then one more thing, and this is uh, very important, and also quite a difficult uh, thing sometimes uh, to wrap your head around, and some there is a lot of uh, vague descriptions uh, that you can find in books and online and in courses and in universities, is the issue, the notion of validity of your findings, which is something that you have to think about as well and demonstrate, especially if you are applying for funding or writing a research proposal, you have to demonstrate how you're going to ensure that the findings from your study will be basically valid and believable and credible. There are many ways in which validity can be achieved. And in essence, most of these ways are about reducing the different types of bias, either resulting from you as the researcher uh, and what is known as research bias, uh, or related to the participants, which is respondent bias, or to the influence of researcher on the studied phenomena and people, which is called reactivity. There are various uh, strategies that you can use to minimize all these influences, such as triangulation or using more than uh, one data source, which is something I already uh, already mentioned in this video, or member check-in, which, uh, which involves clarifying certain meanings and doubts with research participants, to avoid making interpretations of the data as you're interpreting and you're analyzing that data. I summarize uh, several of these common strategies for ensuring validity in a blog article to which I will link under the video just to avoid talking about every single strategy here. So that's about it. So basically, as I said, it's a summary of key things you have to consider. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, also remember that things do change all the time. As I said, it helps to have a general idea uh, beforehand, but things will change all the time. And that's in fact the reason why some refer to, uh, to qual uh, qualitative research as a flexible research design, as opposed to fixed designs, which are quantitative, uh, described quantitative research. Bec because in fact, in qualitative research, uh, that flexibility is just something that's uh, constantly present. And I actually do encourage you to be flexible in so many uh, conversations that I have with you and so many uh, tutorials and, and workshops where, where we work together, I very often stress that flexibility and very often I, I tell you to be creative, to be flexible, to change things the way you like it. And just like I described with uh, data collection methods where you can be and, and I would encourage you to be very uh, creative and flexible. But of course, you do need that uh, that background, you, you need that knowledge. So you do have to do a lot of reading first and then you can afford to be creative and flexible. So this is our rough uh, starting guide. Uh, hope you enjoyed watching it. Like I said, I, I uh, encourage you to explore all the resources uh, that I linked to. I have so many different videos and blog articles as well as the course that I mentioned is four and a half hours of video in which I really go into detail of uh, planning your first research study. You also get my support there so you can uh, communicate with me and I'll answer your questions. So I really feel like it's a really good uh, resource and starting point. Now, if you enjoyed this video and liked some, uh, and learned something new, please like the video, share it with others to help them find it uh, and consider subscribing if you haven't already.